so in this lecture, um, uh, this is the introduction to deep learning. Uh, so this ties in in the book to chapter four. Um, and so I will be going over the, you know, the main ideas of deep learning, basically. So the learning outcomes for the student, um, you know, students will have a better understanding of, you know, deep learning approaches. So today the focus will be on intuition and some aspects of the code in TensorFlow. Okay, so we will discuss um, those main topics. So for this module, uh, you know, we will use, you know, basically Linux, Python, uh, sklearn, and it'll be our sort of introduction to the TensorFlow framework. TensorFlow is really a library for Python. So, uh, you know, Python is our programming language, right, that runs on the Linux environment. We are still going to be using sklearn, although TensorFlow has its own versions of a lot of the sklearn functions basically so but this is a new library that you know provides gives us the capability to develop uh, you know deep learning algorithms basically you know deep uh, neural networks uh, this was developed by Google it's been out since about 2015 uh, so it's you know been out for about four years now so uh, in another video, we will go over how to install the software on the computers, but nowadays it's pretty straightforward to install TensorFlow. There's basically two things you have to consider, you know, basically if you're installing for CPU or GPU, and that's really the difference. So if you're install installing for GPU, you have to include the CUDA libraries, CUDA libraries. All right, but otherwise, if you're just installing for CPU, you don't need really need to use uh, CUDA. All the information about TensorFlow is located at this website. That's the tensorflow.org um, website, basically. All right, so as we have seen in machine learning, basically, whenever we're developing code, uh, you know, one of the main things we want to, you know, focus on is have the appropriate libraries, right? So the libraries make our code very easy. So in previous sklearn libraries, we've already talked about, for instance, all of these. As can be seen, all of these are sklearn uh, libraries that have to do with the evaluation, the metrics. So we have like recall, F1 score, precision, the confusion matrix, accuracy, right? And so all of these we can still use in, um, with TensorFlow, right? So now, why am I doing this? Why, why not, let's say, use the precision and recall from the TensorFlow library instead of using it from the sklearn library? Well, I'm, I'm trying to follow the sequence of the course, and since initially we covered sklearn, and you, you're more familiar with sklearn, I want to show that, you know, you can use both libraries together, and that way also we're only going to use TensorFlow at this point for the things that are specific to deep learning. All right, so anything else that's not specific to deep learning, we can just do in, in sklearn. Um, additionally, you can see here, we have the trains test split. That's you know one of the same libraries we've seen before. Gen from text for reading in our data. Uh, NumPy, and we have pandas. You know, kind of, these are usually the libraries that you will see whenever you're doing machine learning. But now, if you notice, the key aspect that's very important here is that now we've introduced the TensorFlow library. So that's import TensorFlow as TF, right? And this allows us now to bring in, just by adding this one statement here, we bring in all everything that we need for deep learning. So deep learning, uh, you know, I'll provide a little bit of information about deep learning just to kind of give an idea of what it is. It is a very big topic, all right? So I, you know, uh, understanding it is a little bit challenging. Uh, and so at first, I'll, I'm, you know, right now, I'm just going to give some introductions of the topic, some general information about it, and then we're going to start to uh, try to understand how we can build deep 
neural networks. And it's, it's going to be very interesting because our approach will be actually to build a linear regression model first. So we will build a linear regression model. And maybe you've seen linear regression if you've taken a statistics class, but you never realize that a neural network is actually quite similar to linear regression. Right? So we'll have to make some modifications to the um, linear regression model, but the point is that we will be able to get to a neural network from a linear regression model. All right, so you know, first we might have to go from linear regression to logistic regression. Regression. And then from logistic regression, we're going to go to just a regular neural network. And then from a neural network, we will go to a deep neural network. And so what's very interesting about this approach is that most of our time will be spent here, building a linear regression model and a logistic regression model in TensorFlow. Once we understand this, this linear regression model and this logistic regression model, you know, moving to the neural network or to a deep neural network will actually be easier, will be you know, less, less time. But anyway, that will be the approach that we will take. But before we get to this, um, let's just go over a few of the aspects of deep learning. So deep learning algorithms are basically iterative, right? So that's one of the conditions of them. So you basically give them data, right? Data samples, you know, a batch of data maybe, or one sample at a time. And the model takes that and, you know, learns, right? So, so they're iterated in the sense that they load samples in batches to avoid running out of memory. So what does that mean? It means that basically, let's imagine that we have a sample here that's really large, you know, uh, a million records, for instance. In some computers, if you take all one million records at a time, right, all one million records at a time, and you load it in your CPU and your RAM, and then you have to build some very complex model with it, what's going to happen is you're going to run out of memory, right? You're going to run out of memory, and so you will not be able then to, to build a model. It'll not work, it'll crash, etc. So deep learning and, and TensorFlow in particular were created to keep that in mind. They were created to try to, you know, anticipate that problem because whenever we think of deep learning, we always hear this term, big data. And what does big data mean? Big data just means data sets that are really large. Maybe not even a million, but maybe, you know, a hundred million records or, or something, you know, along those lines. So really large data sets. So imagine if you want to give a model 100 million records at a time. You are certainly, if you're just using a, a laptop or, or even kind of a powerful desktop, you're going to run out of memory. Right? And once you run out of memory, you, know, you will not be able to process things. So basically, when TensorFlow was created to avoid this problem of running out of memory, they, the, the TensorFlow framework was designed in such a way that you can take this data here and break it up into batches. That means you're going to break it up into pieces. And then you can train your model simply by iteratively loading batches of the data. So now what's going to happen is, assume you still have the same CPU and RAM, but you no longer have to load all 100 million records at the same time. Instead, maybe you only load uh, 10,000 of them. So you take one iteration, you give it 10,000, train the model, it learns. Next iteration, you load the next 10,000, and so on. You continue like that. So that's what it means to run data in batches. And that's one of the great advantages of deep learning. So that is pretty important, as I said, because that allows you to get around the problem of how do I load my big data set into limited CPU and RAM. So that's one of the great uh, aspects of it. 
So this is very important as it allows you to load millions of data samples and subsets which are called batches. Therefore we can set up the parameters for batch processing. So part of the code um, that you will have to write is really, you know, how do you account for batch processing? So we will see in the next slide that we have, um, you know, you know, some, you know, a little calculation. For instance, that we want to load batches of 100 samples each, right? For a training set, that is about 1,000 samples, right? Similar example to what I just gave here. So if you want to do that, you just have to do a little bit of math. Uh, if you want batches of 100 and you have 1,000 samples, you divide your set into 10 bins of 100 samples each, and therefore you would end up running 10 batches. Right? So intuitively right now, that's one of the important aspects of deep learning that makes it uh, good for big data. All right. Another parameter that's very important is uh, number of epochs. All right, so the number of epochs parameter represents the number of times that we will run our main for loop. So if you want to think of, you know, a, a deep learning algorithm, as I said, it's iterative. So you actually have to have a main loop, a main loop where you do all of your processing. And that main loop is going to perform, you know, a certain number of times. So usually that is called an epic. All right, so that's what that parameter is. So at the very beginning of the code, you have to where you're defining your parameters, you will define the n epics variable and you have to define the size of it. So, you know, that this main loop is the loop that we we will run to provide data to our algorithms for training and testing. So whereas before, you know, we had the data set and we had to break it up into batches, now we have to load those batches into the code um, in a for loop sequentially um, and we're going to perform a number of epics for it. At this point, once you know every epic that is occurring, that's, that's where you actually have the optimization process, right? What we define in the model. All right, so the optimization begins to occur, which helps the supervised learning algorithm to learn from the samples. Okay. But we don't have, to, let's not worry about this. Defining the optimization process is actually uh, very involved in deep learning. We'll have to define four functions for this, so uh, we will get to that. But in, in summary, though, we know so far that, you know, for defining, let's say, our deep learning code, we have a for loop, so for i in range, n epics, n epics, right? We know that. We know that n epics is defined some, some place over here. We have the libraries as well. n epics. And let's say it's just some value like 10,000. And this is a value that you kind of have to play with. All right? So you have to kind of figure it out. And then over here, you're going to have another set of for loops that allows you to do the reading the data in batches. So something like for, uh, for i, or not i, j, for j in batches. in range batches, right? Batches, and so now you've defined that you have, we said initially, batches was 10 batches of 100 samples each, so now you're gonna have this, and now you have to read your data. So I'm just going to make up some pseudocode here, but it's something like read x, which is my data, right? And then we just have to keep track of this, right? So we're going to say something like, you know, j, j plus 100, comma, j plus 100, if the size 
of each batch or each bin is 100 samples. So this would tell us that, you know, the first time, the first iteration, I is zero, right? So it's going to be zero to 100. So we're going to slice out all those records from zero to 100. Next iteration, J, sorry, would be one. So it would be, now this needs to be 100 and then needs to be 200. So this is actually, so once we have the two for loops, this is kind of all we have with our uh, deep learning algorithm so far. You know, we're trying to think of how we have a for loop here, number of epochs that we're repeating. We have, we've defined that that's 10,000. And then to read the data in batches as we defined previously, you know, we do for i in range batches. So there's gonna be 10 of those. And then for j, sorry, so this should be j. For j in range batches, Right, and then we're just going to read our data. So, for instance, here, if we use this formula, x j times 100, this is, you know, there's other ways of doing this more efficiently, but you can see how we can slice out the data. So, first iteration, j is 0, so 0 times 100, that's 0 here. And then the this index here is going to be zero plus one plus 100 so that's 100 so we slice the first bin of data zero to 100 and that's you know assign maybe to our models let's just say we do read and then this gets assigned to x you know some variable that we will later process next iteration now j is one out of the 10 batches so it's going to be one times 100 so that's 100 here and then, then this part is going to be 1 times 100 plus 100, so that's 200. And so now we can slice out the next range in the, bat, in the next batch, basically, from our x. And then we can continue like that. Let's do one more. If this is 2, then it's 2 times 100. That's 200. And then uh, 2 times 100 is 200 plus 100. That's 300. Right? And so that basically gives us our our main code that we have so far, right? So this is kind of what we know about our deep learning algorithm at this point. Learning rate, learning rate is another uh, variable that you want to define in your deep learning algorithm. It has to do with the optimization. So the learning rate value, usually something like 0 0.01, although this can be a function as well, is a very important parameter in the learning algorithm. Simply speaking, it represents the step that is taken in a gradient descent algorithm to find an optimal solution. So the best way to think of that is kind of like, you know, like a giant, right? So, you know, or a, a range of mountains, you know, the Alps or the Rockies. All right, so someone is, you know, a giant, you know, take steps, right? And so the steps can be very big or they can be very small, right? So if it's a very big giant, right, you know, steps are that big. So you can see how the giant is, is, is moving, right? So what do, what do these mountains represent? The mountains represent basically a function, right? They represent the function of, you know, the solution, let's just say for now. So we're trying to find, you know, an optimal solution. So the optimal solutions will be around here, right, in these points. And actually the, the optimal solution might be that one, right? So that's what the algorithm tries to do with something called gradient descent. It tries to go over the mountain range until it finds the optimal solution. But the problem is if the step of the algorithm, where it looks on the function is very big, like this one, it might miss it altogether. Right, and so that's why you need to find a step site that's a, that's a little bit smaller. So, for instance, we have you know a small person there. This small person, because t he or she takes smaller steps, will be able to descend deeper into the valley and find the optimal solution. So, intuitively, that's what the learning rate actually represents. We will come back to this later on, but for now, I'm just discussing this. So, as you can see here. Simply speaking, the learning rate represents the step that is taken in the gradient descent algorithm to find an optimal solution. 
Now, we don't really, when we're doing deep learning, we don't have to worry too much about the gradient descent algorithm or anything like that that's already provided in TensorFlow, but we will have to define the learning rate. This is a value that we will have to define, and intuitively what we want to know is this, right? If we choose a very large step size, like 0.1, for instance, that might represent like this giant, right? Whereas we use something like 0 0.001, this might be like this one. So that's the intuition. There's advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, if you take this uh, learning rate and make it too small, what's going to happen is the basically the person taking the steps is very small. So every step is very small, which means it's going to take a very long time to get to the bottom here. And imagine if they have to traverse the entire valley, it's going to be a lot of work. So Basically, usually what happens is that you pick something by default and start there, and then you might increase it or decrease it depending on your needs. But for a lot of the code that we will use, values like this one or like this one will be, or a range in between them will be sufficient. Okay. So here we have some description of the learning rate. Think of it like a giant walking over a mountainous region with many peaks and valleys. So he's trying to find an optimal location. If the step is too big, the giant could go from peak to peak and skip a valley altogether. On the other hand, if the ste step is too small, the giant may take too long to move in or out of the valley. So in terms of TensorFlow, the, the learning rate can affect convergence. So convergence is another term that has to do with optimization, right? And that basically means that you found the optimal value because it, it could happen that your algorithm does not find the optimal value, but instead it finds this one, right? And it might get stuck there, right? So that happens sometimes, and that's an issue related to something called optimal minima versus global minima. But anyway, at this point, all we have to worry about really is choosing that value and understanding a little bit of the intuition of it. So you can see here a definition, convergence is the term that means that the iterative algorithm is starting to tend to the optimal solution. Okay. All right, so the learning rate can also be assigned a function, right? So this, this can happen sometimes in a deep learning algorithm. So instead of defining, here you can see the variable, instead of just doing learning rate, learning rate equal 0.001, right? We can also define it as a function. This is, you know, you could argue that this is a smarter learning rate for a gradient descent optimizer. You, uh, this is basically a function called an exponential decay that given some parameters, like a starting learning rate, global steps, etc. these are mostly like default values, although you can play with these, um, you know, this function, which belongs to the TF, which is TensorFlow, and within it to the train module, this function will return a more optimal um, learning rate. Now, why is this an advantage? This might be an advantage sometimes where you want the learning rate to change, right? So sometimes, um, you know, maybe the algorithm is taking too long, etc., and so you might want to change that step size to be a slightly bigger one, or you might want to but have a bit more precision. Now, will we be using the, the exponential decay function? Not really for our purposes. For a lot of data sets, you can just take the default uh, value. However, it's good to know that this is available for more advanced work later on. All right, so now that we've talked about all those things, just to kind of give, give an idea of what they are, you can see that basically it boils down to certain parameters that we have to define for our TensorFlow algorithm. We want to define something related to the batches, like the number of batches, something related to the epochs, like the number of epochs, that, you know, how many times do we want to repeat this model? Give it some data and have it learn. Now, sometimes it may even take the data again, right? So, it, you know, it may take some data over a few um, iterations and then again come back and take the same data and just keep training the model. So this is, you know, these are basically the, the parameters that you usually define, the learning rate, which I already explained what it is, 
the number of epochs, and the batch size. So now that we've talked about that, so you know, our any deep learning algorithm in its most simplest form will consist of libraries, right? The parameters that we just define, the loop, right? The main loop that I also define where we you know, perform the loop in epics and perform the um, perform the loop in epics and also perform the reading of the data in batches. Right, so all of that happens in the main loop. However, there's one more thing, and that is that whenever we're after we read the data in batches here, right? So after we read the data. You know, that's where we now have to process the data, right? So we have to, you know, let's say model the data, right? And this step, model the data, actually is where you define the architecture of your deep neural network and you do a lot of things related to your deep neural network. So this model data here could be basically one simple, you know, function y, right? You know, we build a function. But this y needs to be defined, All right? So we're going to define y here. And as I said, this is where we define what optimization we're going to use, what you know, architecture we're going to use, et cetera. And so a lot of the work of building a deep neural network is done here, All right? Building our architecture and everything else. So that's what I would call the, you know, uh, it, this is the basic structure of it, all right, and you can see that here. So deep learning algorithms and TensorFlow consti consist of a basic structure, right? Simply put, they have the main loop. You can see that here. That's the main loop. So there it is. The initialization section, which is, you know, you could argue it's these, right? Um, so this section here the initialization section where you initialize the libraries and the parameters. So we have these two accounted for. The declaration of the main variables and placeholders. So that's going to be these, you know, the, the X that we read here, right? So we need to define. So actually somewhere in here, we need to have one more item, which is the declaration of the variables and placeholder. So x, you know, tf dot placeholder. Okay, something like that. So this variable uh, needs to be defined. All right. So uh, actually, TensorFlow uses two elements. To everything in TensorFlow is actually a buffer in memory, right? A buffer, a, a matrix, or a buffer in memory. But really, there's, a, and we'll see this in the next slides. There's a, a separation of these into variables and placeholders. Okay. And then finally, this part where we define the architecture would be the definition of the classifier to you. So let's just say classifier. So as we can see in summary, simply put, the basic structure of a deep learning algorithm in TensorFlow is to have a main loop, the initialization made up of the libraries and parameters, the declaration of the variables here that we're going to use. This is our data. So whenever we read data, we load it into these variables, the buffers, and then finally the definition of the classifier to use, right? Which is this part takes a lot of code, all right? So this is actually separated into several functions, and that's where we define the architecture. So whenever you think of a deep neural network, this is where you're building the hidden layers and all of that. So this is the arc, and that's referred to as the architecture. All right, so that's the architecture. So the part that we are mostly familiar with when we do neural networks, right, that we see something that looks like this, this, that, you know, and then this, 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 the hidden layers, right? And then maybe we have a two-class problem. 
and then we have our input vectors over here. So that's our uh, neural network, right? We all know that they kind of look like this, and so on, right? So this model, if we want to tie this little diagram to the code, we can think of it. Of it. What I was trying to say is now, you know, we're all familiar with uh, a, a neural network kind of looks like that. If we want to tie this back to the code, we can really say that this part here is defined here, right, in that architecture. This part here is technically that, the placeholder. Take our data, load it into the first layer of the network, build the architecture here in these two layers, and this also, the, the class, is kind of connected to the classifier, I would say, so kind of like that. So that's basically, you know, we, we don't actually build these models graphically, right? Instead, we write them in code, but this is kind of how they tie in together. All right, this is another interesting graph. So going back to the epics. So um, in, we'll see when we do our code that we can create this plot this graph actually as well and it's very useful and very intuitive. So as you can see this is a graph of epics. This is epics. So this is epics and this is the score. So what's happening here is you know we said that a deep neural network is iterative. Right so a deep neural network is iterative. Oops. And so what that basically means is that every iteration, we give it some data, we train the model, we can also give it some test data, for instance, and then see how the model is doing. Right? So intuitively, from you know, whenever we think of machine learning, we think that you know, if we haven't given it enough data, the model doesn't learn very well, so the performance is going to be low, poor. But over time, as it gets enough data, enough samples of the population, then the model starts to improve, right? And then it might plateau and become consistent. And this happens in deep, deep learning, right? So you can see here, maybe from zero to about 200 epics, the accuracy score is still pretty low. Zero, pretty much the beginning, then it starts to go up here. And then at some point, this is 0 0.8. So at some point, after 200 iterations or epics, you can see that the accuracy of the model starts to improve, and you can see that there. All right, and so this is an important uh, feature of our deep neural networks, right, that we, we can do this, right? So you will be able to see then that maybe 27,000 epics is not at all necessary. It may also happen that at some point you might have, you know, oh, you're training it too much, right? So overtraining, let's say, and so the model then could even start going down. It may, it's not going to go down so drastically, but it might start going down as well. So there is a optimal space, and there is no science to this, right? There is no science. This is usually kind of an art. You have to um, play with the data, get a feel for it, and then play with the parameters, you know, number of epics, batch size, um, and the learning rate until you find an optimal solution. But here we can see that the problem now is starting to do, do well because we're getting to 0.80 or 80% accuracy. So in the previous example, um, you know the graph. Explanation. So we can see in this example on the figure a deep net of what architecture we don't know. You know, it could be any architecture. A deep net net takes a few epochs, about 200, to learn how to detect and classify the samples. You know, after about 200 epochs, a deep net of say two hidden layers, right, stabilizes and is able to maintain a consistent accuracy score. And that's really what you're looking for when you're building a neural network. Right? And so all these tools kind of help you to um, 
to get a better understanding of your model. So what's it all about, right? So, um, so again, the focus here is not to discuss deep learning from the equations point of view, right? Not at all. Um, I'm basically trying to give as much intuition, and I know some, you know, some terms will become more familiar as we progress with them. Um, but the focus here is not to discuss deep learning from the equations point of view or doing any derivatives or anything like that, or proofs. Um, so those are all very important concepts, of course, uh, but can be overwhelming when starting, right? So the idea is not to make this overwhelming. Instead, is to just you know write a simple machine learning uh, algorithm or script. That's really ultimately the goal. So instead, I want to help the reader or the you know the students in, in looking at these lectures and videos uh, to write deep learning code with TensorFlow. Right, so that will be our main focus here. So most of these slides are not about going too in depth in the theory, but instead in just to provide uh, enough intuition to understand why we're doing things and to be able to write the code as simple as possible. Later on, as you as you write more code, you know, and solve more problems, it'll become more obvious. Then the you know the the student will no doubt have many questions where the theory and fundamentals will help him or her to better understand and use the algorithms. You know, and that, and that will happen. So maybe like with that decay function, right? So you kind of get the idea of why the decay, but you might want to dig in more deeply and figure out how the decay actually works and where, you know, that's going to tie into the theory and the fundamentals. But we are going to start simple, as I said, we're actually going to start with just a linear regression in TensorFlow, not even a, a deep neural network. Now, in the next set of slides, I have some figures. You can see the fi this figure here and then this figure here, right? So these two figures are very important. Uh, what do they represent? We have samples that are red and then we have samples that are blue. Right? And, and they have been compressed using a technique called principal component analysis. Um, so it's just a technique for like taking a data set that's large in the feature space and reducing it to something that can be graphed. But don't worry about PCA at this point. Let's just think of this data. Right? Um, and so we want to build a classifier that can separate uh, the, the blue samples from the red samples with the highest accuracy. Right, and we can see here that, for instance, um, and with the fewest errors possible. So, for instance, if we did a line here, right, for this data set, this will result in a lot of errors, right, and a lot of errors. If we do it over here, that might have fewer errors. If we do it here, might be fewer errors. And if we do this curve like this, that might result in the smallest amount of errors. Because as you can see, some of these are blue, you know, the, you know, and then there's few reds, still quite a few, but very few reds. So not as many errors as we could have if we had written the line here or somewhere else. So that's really the goal of a machine learning algorithm is that you have data sets like this one, and then you want to, the model is really just this line. So everything that goes into building a machine learning algorithm at the end of the day, it turns out it's just a line or maybe this curve that we see over here, this curve that's there, right? That's the model. And the objective is to build one of these three lines or that curve that allows you to build a model with the smallest amount of errors. Okay, that's basically the goal. So if we go back to the slides here, uh, the figures below present some of the challenges that must be addressed when dealing with real data, right? So, you know, if you, if you look at the IRIS data set or MNIST, those have been built, those data sets have been built for academic purposes. So that basically means that, um, you know, they've been built for academic reasons. They're easy to manipulate. The results are always high, you know, high accuracy. 
But if you're dealing with you know, cybersecurity problems or you have a lot of packet data or you're looking at phishing attacks on email or different kinds of uh, data sets like that, the data is going to be noisy. It's going to have a lot of you know, things that confuse the machine learning algorithm. So it's not always as straightforward. And that's one of the challenges here. So, and that's why we build deep neural networks. So the idea is that, you know, some of the, so basically we can divide a machine learning algorithm into two categories, linear and non-linear, right? That's really what, what that means. And, or that's basically the two categories. So what does that mean? It means that the classifier that we'll, we're building, it's basically a line or it's not a line, it is like a curve, right? That's what that represents. So let's say something like logistic regression. You know, I'm just thinking of one algorithm, logistic regression. This is one machine learning algorithm that is linear. It basically only builds lines. That's all you have. It's a type of hammer that you know just hits that type of nail. Right, so it just hit, creates lines. Whereas other algorithms like a deep neural net or a neural net, neural net are capable of building other models, models that are no longer straight lines, but instead they're you know, more curvy things, right? And the more curvy things might be able to fit the data a little bit better. So intuitively, this is the, whenever you think of, you know, you might ask yourself, why do we have 15 machine learning algorithms? Well, this is kind of the intuition, right? That they're always trying to find an algorithm that's a little bit better than just making things like a line, right? So maybe making it like a curve, a polynomial, that kind of a thing. So anyway. Uh, and so that's why, you know, we lead in from logistic regression, which is actually a really good classifier to more advanced algorithms like deep neural nets. By the way, deep neural nets don't just create nonlinear functions, but they, they have other properties as well. Uh, but this is just an example to intu intuitively understand this. So as I was saying, um, you know, why do we have so many machine learning algorithms? So, you know, some of them you might divide uh, your machine learning algorithms into two categories, linear and nonlinear algorithms. So linear algorithms, um, you know, something like logistic regression, whereas nonlinear algorithms are something like uh, a deep neural net. So the difference between them is that a linear algorithm only builds functions that are straight lines, for instance, whereas nonlinear algorithms can be other shapes, curves. Oops. So they can be curves you know, some type of a, a polynomial, you know, different kinds of things like that. All right, so, and why, you know, why is that important? Because not all problems are easy to classify, right? So it's not like every problem looks like this, right? It'd be great if all problems look like this, but that's not the case. You know, sometimes we have problems that might look like this, Right, so the problems look like this. There is no straight line that solves this. What's the solution to this? Well, the solution to this is to have a circle, right? A circle, you know, a simple shape, like a circle would solve the problem with perfect accuracy, but that basically means that we need other solutions. And so deep neural nets do help us with that a little bit. You know, and this happens, as I said, because real data is not clean like this. It's not straightforward. Instead, real data is messy. So we can see that here. Real data, such as language data from Twitter, for instance, or network data from like, you know, packet captures or malware analysis, is highly noisy, right? So this data is highly noisy um, and on balance sometimes. So an imbalance in the data means, for example, that 80% of the samples belong to class one and the remaining samples belong to, uh, remaining, and the remaining 20% belong to another class. A good example of this is in fraud detection, for instance. So think of fraud detection, 
So in fraud detection, what do you have? Most of the transactions will be just regular transactions, actual, you know, business, valid business, you know, maybe even as high as 95% or more will be just valid transactions. And then maybe 5% or less will be actual fraud. So if you're trying to build a machine learning algorithm or a deep learning algorithm with this data, you're going to have what is called an imbalance, a high imbalance between valid data class one and fraud data class two, for instance, right? So that presents challenges in itself. So therefore training a classifier to say perform emotion classification that is also highly imbalanced data can be a difficult task. Uh, in, the, in the next few slides, I have some data from Twitter, right? The, the Twitter data is represented. And each, in, each sample in the data set had multiple features, but was compressed in a two-dimensional vector for just for visualization purposes. But it still captures the main intuition of, of what we're trying to say. So you can see the data is actually here. This is, you know, uh, this just has PCA1 and PCA2, which are basically the two, in a, in a, we created a, a two-dimensional vector space, PCA1, PCA2, right, from a, a, a multi-dimensional space. And right? so we may have had a multi-dimensional space with multiple features. We just compressed it with PCA to arrive at something that we can actually plot. But what we can see here is once we try to plot this data, you know, we could, again, build multiple lines, right? We can build multiple lines there to try to separate the data. All right? Now, the problem is the data is highly imbalanced. You can, obviously, we can see, for, for instance, that the red data seems to dominate the blue data. All right? So that might be, let's think of a fraud type of example where the red are the valid transactions and the blue are the fraud. So I say blue is fraud, and then red samples are valid transactions or something along those lines. So what happens here is, first of all, you have a high class imbalance. Then of, also we have that the data is actually really difficult to separate because it's very, what, it's very, um, it overlaps basically. So we can see that there's like a bit of a cluster of blue around there, right? But we can't really build a classifier like this, right? If we're, if we're only looking at linear classifiers, we really only have the option of building lines. So we can see here, you know, we might want to build a classifier that, like, that is like that. We would capture a lot of the blue. We do have some blue over here, so really, then if we wanted to build like a perfect classifier, we would want to do something like that, maybe like that, and like that, and then that one, or something like that, right? So that might be, let's imagine intuitively that that's the most accurate classifier. This one will still have errors, right? Because we can see it within this circle, there's still red and blue mixed in. But that is the objective of a machine learning algorithm. We have our data, each one of these points is a sample in a vector space and we are trying to build the best model or select the best model. So the yellow here is some kind of a model that we built. We could also build a model like that. We can also build a model like this. The model is just a curve, etc. So whenever we're choosing a machine learning algorithm, ultimately, and we have a data set like this, this is what we're choosing. We're choosing one of these. So this might be logistic regression. This might be a neural net. This might be a decision tree, right? But ultimately, all of these things are getting us to create some way of segmenting the data and minimizing. So there is some criteria, and the criteria is that we need to minimize the number of errors. Right, so the number of errors that we have. So this should include most of the blue and very few of the red. If we think of it in another way, I could build this model, 
this model, this, the one inside, is actually a little bit more accurate than the other one. Why? Because it captures more of the blue and less of the red. So this, even though they may be very poor, even though maybe this one has like an error rate of uh, 60%, this one may also have a very high error rate, but the error rate might be, let's say, 50. So we reduce the error rate a, a little bit, and so therefore select that between the two, this is the better one. Right? And so ultimately, that is the goal of machine learning right? and when we're trying to select the model. So that's what it's all about. So as can be seen, the data and the figures has a high overlap in the classes and the data is difficult to separate. A linear classifier, the, such as the lines that we have been discussing that you can see in the graph, can only separate a small portion of the samples and the majority are not easy to separate in that space. So you can see that here. So um, I can go ahead and erase all of this. And now we can see that we have our data here. If we're only using a linear model, we build a line, a straight line. And if we look at this line or that line or this line, we can definitely conclude that this third one here the one that separates the pink from the blue, is the, the better of the three. How do we conclude that? Because this one will result in the smallest number of errors. Obviously, this one is pretty bad. You know, this, this one it would imply that all the red are here, and all the blue are here, which is not true. This one also implies that, you know, the same. But this third one, at least, is the optimal one because it says, well, we missed a lot of blue, but at least we got a lot of blue here and very few red. So really what determines that this is a good one is that these red that we see here are not as many, right? And then the, even here it's even less dense for red and we still have a few blue. So all of all these three for this type of problem, they're terrible uh, choices. But of the three really bad choices, this one is the slightly better one just because the error rate is lower than the other ones. And that's basically what it's all about. That's the kind of the intuition of why we do this. Now, the other additional intuition is that we have a straight line, right? But we said that we can also build curves. So, so how can we get more of the samples of one class without getting too many of the samples of the other class? Well, the answer is that we could use another type of line for the separation, right? So for instance, instead of using a straight line, we could use a curved line, right? This is why some algorithms are called linear and others are called nonlinear. So nonlinear algorithms can sometimes create better separations in the data and therefore obtain fewer errors. In the next figure, an example of this is shown using support vector machines, which is another algorithm that you may have heard about out there. Uh, was very popular up until deep learning be became the, the best set of machine learning algorithms. So SVN methods can sometimes build better nonlinear classifiers because of some specific abilities they have to project data to higher dimensional spaces. We won't really talk about that uh, here uh, as that is a more specific issue to support vector machines. But you know that, you know, let's just say they, they do have a capability to be more efficient. And deep neural networks can be used to learn nonlinear models as well. And so you can see how deep neural nets actually meet, you know, one of the uh, properties or the conditions that we would want to have a good model. This property of nonlinear models can help to obtain better classification accuracy scores or at least reduce the error rates. Right? And you can see this is in the next figure. You can see that here. I can erase this that I had created or I cannot. It's already said. All right. So, but anyway, so this, um, as you can see here, the main, the main aspect is that 
Whereas before we used a straight line like that to separate the data. Now, here, this is almost a straight line except for this like curve, right? So we, you know, we have a little curve here. And that curve actually, uh, basically by making that part of the line a curve, you know, we left a few red on this side and very f almost no red on that side. So as you can see, that's what may have resulted in a better accuracy, is the fact that by creating this little curve here, this bump, if you will, we left all of the red on one side and no red on the other side. And so at least for this segment of our problem, although it's here it's terrible, at least for this segment of our problem, we've done a little bit better. All right, in our classification. All right, so that's how uh, a curve model can also help. Although these are not always uh, great, um, there can be something called overfitting. That you know, when something doesn't generalize well to the model. So don't just think that whenever you have a curved line, then that's a better solution. That's not exactly how it works. But just think of the intuition of this, right? That you have straight lines and then you have other lines that can separate in slightly different ways. And so ultimately though, it is up to the machine learning algorithm to you know, build a separation space and then based on the results, you're gonna know if it's good or not. You don't usually, so when you do machine learning, you're not usually going to visualize the data like this. You know, you just rely on the accuracy scores. But intuitively, though, we can have a sense of what's going on or what are the problem, problems, the challenges, and what are the objectives that we're trying to achieve. So the figure that we just saw shows a SVM classifier building a nonlinear separation line, the curved line in the graph on the data. It could be expected that a deep neural network could build even better separation boundaries and that different architectures would get different results. So that's sort of like saying that now you're gonna have what we saw before, right? So a curve that's kind of like that is basically breaking up into segments and picking just the right data. So that's sort of the intuition with deep neural networks here. And that different architectures could give different results. Uh, so this takes us to the very important aspect of deep learning architecture, right? So Let's say to achieve a classifier that separates the data like this, or you know, imagine the example I gave before, right? To build that, that particular shape, or this particular shape, or some other particular shape, it'll depend on the architecture, right? So that's what we are going to define. We're going to build architectures that allow us to segment the space in a more efficient way. So deep learning architecture is where we, de where we define the parameters, all right? So, so now that we understand this concept, this intuition, now we can see why this is important, right? So for, again, as I said, for us to build these shapes, we are going to have to build an architecture. We don't always know what the shape will look like, based on the architecture, we don't really know that. What we do know is that if I build this architecture, I get this accuracy score. And if I build this other architecture, I get this other accuracy score. So that's really what allows, it to to allows us to determine which architecture is better and which architecture is worst. So deep learning architecture is where we define the parameters, uh, such as the number of layers, the number of neurons that define the deep neural network. All right, so that is to say that to build this shape, we would have to build three hidden layers, right? With let's say 128 neurons each, all right? Whereas if we build a neural network with just two layers and just like two or three neurons, we would build this one, right? So that this architecture builds us this one, this architecture builds us that one, all right? So that's kind of how things tie in. So again, I'll repeat, deep learning architecture is where we define the parameters, such as the number of layers, three versus two, and the number of neurons, let's say 128, versus just like two or three, okay?
and that translates into the decision boundaries, right? Where the decision boundaries are what allows us to separate our data from one set of samples to another set of samples. So you can think of this as the way that you construct the line that you want to build and use, right? Which is what I just said. So where the line, remember, doesn't have to be a straight line, but it can be lines that look like that. So we will discuss in the next sections, um, we will discuss this in the next sections, but it is important to know that you can define many deep learning architectures, right? So a lot of the work that you will be doing when you build your deep neural networks will be just that, defining the architectures. Because for the most part, once you've done a few machine learning algorithms and a few deep learning algorithms, you can reuse a lot of the code. So one, you know, once you've done them, you can use most of the code and you'll make basically two changes. You'll change the way that you're reading the data because now your data set has changed, right? So you have to account for that. And then the architecture might be different because you might need different boundaries to obtain different results, right? So you'll play around with the architecture itself. So deep learning definition, uh, deep learning systems are neural networks with many layers. So in this uh, discussion, um, we will provide, I'll provide a definition of deep learning. Right? And so deep learning systems are basically neural networks with many layers, right? So where we define a neural network as usually a connection of neurons, right? You have one, two, three neurons, then you have one, two, three, four, or five neurons, and you have one, two neurons, right? And these are connected. So basically these three neurons are inputs, sorry, are inputs to that, uh, this neuron here, and then these neurons are inputs to the next one, right? So that's what a neural network is. And so these types of architectures are what we are trying to define. Right, so a deep neural, net, deep neural deep learning systems are neural networks with many layers. Right, so that that implies really that now this the output layer went over here, and then these in here. Well, this is the so this is the input layer. This is the output layer. But now in between the input layer and the output layer, we have one, two, three layers. Right, so that makes it deep because there are several of them. So as such, the more layers they have, the deeper they are considered. Right, so this is a deep neural network, whereas uh, by some standards, the one that we had before with just three layers is not a deep neural network. It would only be a neural network. So in the next set of slides, uh, I will discuss, uh, I will begin to discuss neural networks. I will focus mostly on the intuition, all right, when talking about neural networks. Uh, and we will use linear regression, actually, to begin our discussion. And then from linear regression, we will see that linear regression can actually be modeled as a neural network because it's simply a model that has inputs and it kind of has outputs, and that's it. There's nothing in between, so no hidden layers. And so we'll see that both linear, linear regression and logistic regression are models that look like this. That is to say, input layer, output layer, but no hidden layers in between. If we start adding layers, a logistic regression algorithm now becomes a neural network or a deep neural network. So uh, we will use linear regression and logistic regression constructs to define uh, deep neural networks. We can also think of deep neural networks as functions and this will become very useful as we start to program the code. So we will see that you know we have function one, which is actually hidden layer one, and hidden layer one is actually mx plus b, right? So it's the input, the initial, that goes into h1. And then now, for the next layer, you will see that it's just, instead of x now, it's going to be h1, right? Plus another b. And then now we have a hidden layer, two hidden layer, then we have the output layer, we can call it Y, and that's just going to be H2 plus B. So as you can see, the idea of the hidden layers, which is here, can actually be written in function format as well. All right, And so we will see that later on, but that's kind of the, 
you know, what's coming up. So deep learning architecture is, you know, where we define the parameters, such as layers and neurons that define the neural network, right? So, you know, if we want to think of this is just a logistic regression algorithm, algorithm, so logistic regression, this is a neural network algorithm, oops, so this is a neural net. So this is a neural net. Now if I want a deep neural net or a deep network, then it's just going to be take this one, you know, that input, that output, but in between now we just happen to have one more layer or several layers. It could be three, four, five layers. That makes it a deep network. But as you can see, you know, graphically as we were looking at them, the mechanics are the same. So whenever we talk about architecture, we are talking about how many neurons do we have in each layer? And that could be the output layer, the input layer, or any layer. So let's say this is at 128, this is four, and this is two. So this translates into saying that we have two classes with four inputs, and then we have four layer, four neurons in between. Now, why four, in, four neurons and not six or seven? Well, that's actually more of an art than a science. It really depends on the architecture or the architect in this case, but there are some rules of thumb or some hints as to what to select. So you can think of this as the way that, as I said, uh, you can think of this as the way that you construct the line that you want to build and use. So in a previous set of videos, I have discussed this already. It is important to know that you can define many deep learning architectures, right? So that basically just says, yes, this is a deep neural network with two hidden layers, but, you know, I can make something like that, you know, and that is a deep net with four layers. And I can build even more complex architectures with things called uh, convolutional neural networks or RNNs or other types of architectures, right? So certainly it can, you know, we could just say dot, dot, dot. So now that we've talked about uh, deep learning, remember that deep learning is a theoretical framework the math, if you will, or the algorithms. But, so that's the, the theory or the theoretical framework. Then we need a way to implement deep learning. So there are several solutions. The one that we are using in this class is TensorFlow. However, there's other solutions, Torch, um, et cetera. You know, there's other ones. So if whenever we're talking about something like deep learning, we want to understand the intuition, but then as we start writing the code, we need to understand basically the mechanics or the specific issues related to the TensorFlow library. All right, so now uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit of just a few of the Im important aspects of TensorFlow. Hopefully once we have all this information, then as we start building our, our models with TensorFlow, it'll become easier. So the main idea with TensorFlow is that you need to define a graph. All right, so unfortunately, um, you know, the programming that we are used to doing is usually sequential. We saw this when we did sklearn, for instance. You know, we are, we are used to writing functions. We get some inputs, outputs, continue writing, and everything is sequential. However, here we are dealing with, because we have problems like big data, we have big data, and we want to do things very efficiently, very efficiently. You know, programming in TensorFlow requires a new style. So there's a new coding style. It's a new coding style. So what I would say is that now, instead of just writing code that is sequential, we have to think of our code uh, as writing code that defines what is called a computational graph. So that's how TensorFlow works. So TensorFlow builds computational graphs. 
we're almost defining the computational graph and we don't run anything. We just write the code and then at the end we have to create what is called a session and then given that session we are going to run the entire graph. So using TensorFlow will require some getting used to because it is a different style of coding. So again, I'll repeat then, the main idea with TensorFlow is that you need to define a graph. And you run your code through this graph on either CPUs and GPUs. Now the advantage of using this graph is that also you write code that doesn't have to be specific for the CPU and then you go ahead and you have to write other code that's specific for the GPU. You know, for any of you that have tried to write uh, code specific for a GPU, you would probably know that you have to use the C language and you have to use the CUDA library. And it's actually very, it's one of the most difficult things you can do in programming to write code that is written in parallel using CUDA. Whereas with, if you're writing for the CPU, it's gonna be more of the traditional code that we're used to writing. So the reason why TensorFlow uses these graphs is that you can define these computational graphs and they have the great advantage that the computational graph will run pretty much the same way in the CPU or the GPU. So you only have to define code once that can run on both your CPU or your GPU with no changes or with very few changes. Right? And so that is one of the great advantages of TensorFlow. So a few more things about TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is object oriented, so everything is an object in TensorFlow. Uh, you know, the name actually is divided into two words, tensor and flow. Tensor comes from physics. It uh, basically means a matrix of, of high dimension or multiple dimensions. And flow just means it captures this idea of the graph, right? So, you know, things flow through a graph. And so if you build a computational graph, what you end up having is you have a whole bunch of tensors that are flowing through the graph from beginning to end. So tensors, this word tensor here, is actually a multi-dimensional array. So we know, for instance, that we can have a one-dimensional array, we have you know, two-dimensional arrays, we can have a cube, you know, which would be a three-dimensional array, and then we can have a hypercube or, or, or cubes that are of higher dimension space. And so those we just called multi-dimensional arrays, or guess what, tensors. All right, so that's, so that's where the name comes from. Now, TensorFlow variables are nothing more than memory buffers, right? So, um, so whenever you define, and we, this will become a little bit more obvious when we talk about placeholders, and we see this in the code, but basically um, the variables in TensorFlow are, are just um, memory buffers, some buffer in memory, and these memory buffers are just allocated space that needs to be big enough to contain our abstract concept of a tensor, all right? The, the dimensional variable or object that we are creating. So um, another thing about TensorFlow is because it's object oriented, the main object in TensorFlow is TF. So whenever we did import TensorFlow as TF, we are gonna use TF to reference TensorFlow. And we call elements from TensorFlow by referencing this object. So for instance, if I want to call something like the definition of a variable placeholder, I can just say tf.placeholder. So that'll become more obvious later on, but that this is pretty common when you see this, you know you're looking at TensorFlow code. So as I said in TensorFlow, you need to define a graph and then run it. So those are the two things. So you know, you do everything in Python. You don't have to worry about CUDA libraries. You just install them. If you have a GPU initially, everything should work if the configuration is done correctly. Then you start writing your Python code, and the first thing you do in your Python code is write or define the graph. So you want to define the graph, and then you run it. Nothing runs until you call the graph with an object called a session. All right, so that's kind of the, how TensorFlow works. You create these sessions, and then the sessions run everything. TensorFlow gets its name from the fact that data is stored as tensors, and the tensors flow through this graph. So that's kind of intuitive. So here's our very first uh, TensorFlow code. 
All right, so this is the hello world of TensorFlow. You will find this everywhere pretty much, right? And so this is the, the simplest code that we have to do, you know, that everyone sees basically when they're building TensorFlow code. So how does it work? Basically, let's break it up into sections that are common. You know, you'll have your imports and libraries, right? Then you have the session, right? So that's another element. And then you have the actual thing that you're doing, which is that. This is just printing the result, basically. You can see that here as well. You know, we print. Now, this is another way of writing it. We have the session here. We run the session, which basically means we run the code that we want to execute. All right, so that's, those are the important elements. So session, the code itself, and the libraries. So let's now go through this line by line. All right, so we can see here, the first line is import TensorFlow as TF. So that's pretty straightforward. You bring the library TensorFlow, and you're going to reference it by TF. Then you want to use it. All right, so TensorFlow is object-oriented, so it's got modules, functions, etc. So here we use tf.constant, all right? And constant just means that it creates an object that is always going to be a constant. And what does the constant contain? It contains the word hello, comma, TensorFlow, exclamation, in that little phrase. That gets assigned into the word hello. But here's the tricky thing, okay? So most of us, if we've never seen TensorFlow before, after we do the second line, we will want to do something like this. Print, oops, sorry. We will want to do print hello, right? You'll want to do that intuitively because you know that usually works in Python. However, this will not work with TensorFlow. If you do this, it'll give you an error. Because what, what this represents is that you started building the graph, but you have not run the graph yet with session. So you didn't run it yet. And so it doesn't exist, and it's definitely then, here it's, it's going to give you a, uh, you know, an error. So instead, if you want to print hello, what you have to do is, you have to next create the session. So you're gonna do session equal TF session, all right, once you have the session created, then you need to run your graph. Now, where is the graph? The graph is, starts at hello. Hello is like the root node that you can, because if you call hello, hello is equal to this, so it's gonna reference the entire thing. So now you do session.run hello, and then the result of that can be printed, and it will be hello TensorFlow. All right, another example of this with the same code is you create A and B, TF constant 10, TF constant 32. If you try to print B, it's not going to work. All right, so once again, it's not going to work because um, you haven't, you've, you've only defined the graph, but you haven't run the graph yet. Instead, what you can see here is we, we can do print session.run, and now we've added this new element. So another way of writing this could be that I, I could write y tf dot add a comma b. Right, and then here, instead of having this, I can just say run y. So that might be a little bit more consistent with the previous one. So what I'm doing here is I'm building the graph. So I have a and b, which are 10 and 32, two nodes. And then these two nodes, a and b, are added together by using, oh, this should be tf, by using tf.add. So I call the TensorFlow module. From within it, I call the add function, and I add a and b together, and the result is there in y. Now, I still can't just do print y. I have to do session run, so I run the graph, which basically means I call y, which ends up calling a and b, which are these two, and then it executes the entire operation. So once I do session.run y, I have my result, I print it, and this should be equal to 42, which I believe is the answer to the universe, right? So, all right, so anyway, so that's the, um, the result of adding those two numbers.
And that's basically our first TensorFlow code. So in the previous code, we initialized two variables, A and B, add them together. Additionally, we initialized the session object with session equal tf.session. What is important to note here is that whenever you reference an object in TensorFlow with tf, such as, an initialization, such as initializing the variable A, you are actually adding elements or nodes to the graph. So that's really what you're doing. You're defining the graph, constructing the graph. The graph does not get executed until the command session run is called. So if you never call it, you only define the graph, but you never actually ran the graph. And the graph can be seen in the following figure. All right. So the previous code, if you remember, we had the constant A, the, const, the constant B. That basically represented this node and that node. And then we created the Y, which was really tf.add of A and B, right? And so that's this node. So you can see how that no this node now gets added to the graph. And then you have your output, which could be the Y there. Right? So you can see that, see that. And so that code that we previously defined actually translates into a simple graph that looks like this. Right? And that's how TensorFlow works. Right? So you're building graphs. So it's a little bit more difficult in that sense that you always have to make sure that your outputs become inputs to something else until you get to the final uh, solution. So in its simplest explanation, this is how TensorFlow works and how you create uh, TensorFlow graphs. So in this uh, segment, uh, I will discuss how to load your data into your TensorFlow code. All right, so we're gonna take for this very simple example, um, the Iris dataset that should be familiar to everyone by now if you've done the lab assignment. Um, so just as a reminder, the Iris dataset has four features, right, and one class. So it's really a data set that looks like this. All right, so we can see there's class one, so there's zero, one, two. So it's a three class problem, three classes, and four features. And this is our Iris data set, okay? So we want to load this data into TensorFlow. So loading data, the data can actually be somewhat complicated in TensorFlow, and it's usually complicated in all machine learning, right? So, you know, it's always about getting the data set to be in the right format, but usually once we have that, you know, we can just give it to a program like Weka. With sklearn, there's slightly more challenges. With deep learning and TensorFlow in particular, there's even more challenges, uh, you know, with it. So the data can be complicated. One of the issues is that you need to convert the data, say from something like the below example, you know, the, the example of the iris data set into a format, into another format using what is called one hot encoding of the label. So if you look at some of the previous videos, you will see that we've already discussed what one hot encoding means. But basically this has to be done and this is specific to um, TensorFlow and that is that you have classes that look like 0, 1, 2, 0 and that has to be converted into vectors that look like 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, oh sorry, 0, 1, 0 here and then 0, 1, 0 and then this one is 0, 0, 1 and then this one is again 1, 0, 0. So that's what one hot encoding means, right? We have to go from this, so we have to take this column of the class and we have to slice it out of the matrix and then we have to take that sliced out uh, vector basically and convert it into a matrix of size, whatever this is, n by three. All right, so that's one of the challenges of it. So this can sometimes be complicated and can cause problems when writing your algorithms. So as we know, Iris, the, the previous data set, has three classes, 0, 1, and 2. The other four columns represent the features per each sample. You know, they're like, the, you know, Iris is plants, so it's the size of the plant, etc. Uh, 
the data is contained in the, in the file iris.csv, right? So we know that. So that's how we can reference that file. At this point, luckily for us, we don't have to do much with batch processing or big data sets. You know, this is a very small data set. We know there's 150 samples and it's well balanced. So there's 50 samples each for the three classes. For, so for this, we'll just take uh, something very easy from the NumPy library. We will we'll use the load txt function to obtain the data and to load it into a NumPy matrix. Remember that NumPy we define as something similar to, for those of you familiar with MATLAB, it's just a library for performing vector and matrix, matrix operations. Notice that the file has a header for the class and the four features, right? So it has this header here. And so we will have to do something about that header to delete it. Uh, yeah. So we can easily remove the header by using the parameter skip rows equal one uh, in the numpy.loadtxt function. So we've seen all this already in one of the previous labs with sklearn, but you know this is an important aspect in loading our data. So we can see the code summarized here. So to load the data, we will create a numpy matrix f numpy. Let's say we open data iris csv. We tell it to read the data. We use the numpy.loadtxt function. We're going to read f numpy, which is this one. We say that the delimiter is commas because it's comma separated, and we skip the first row, which is the one that contains the headers. So now we have our data in matrix data. So if you remember, uh, we saw in the data that the first column is the class. So class zero is the or column zero is the class, and then one, two, three, and four are the feature columns, right? So we want to slice this out in such a way that we get all the rows of zero for the class, and then these uh, one, two, three, and four columns, all of them for the data. So that's what we want to do here. And so quite simply, we take matrix data and we do this. This is called slicing, if you remember, when we add the colon, you know, so we do colon, that means all rows, and then we say comma from one to four. So that basically means that that's all the features. So that's why this gets assigned to the X value. If we knew the next one made for matrix data, we take all rows by indicating colon, comma, and then we just pick one column, which is zero. That is the class and that gets assigned to Y. And so now we end up with our X and our Y data, which are really the thing that we need to perform our analysis. So in the previous code, we can slice the class column into the Y variable, we saw that, and the rest of the columns into the X variable. Notice that this is a lowercase Y, that's just convention, and because this is a matrix, this is a vector, this is a matrix, this is an uppercase X. When slicing a 2D matrix, such as matrix IJ, we specify the number of rows with I and the number of columns with J. So we can also specify ranges by doing the following. So for instance, matrix two to five, that would mean rows two to five and all the columns in those rows. So here the colon on the J index indicates to select all columns. If we wanted to select from a list of column indices, we could do the following, and you can see that here. So we do all rows, and then we just want columns one, two, let's say we don't even want three, it's five and six. It's just, so it's just going to pick those columns, right? So this is, you know, basically falls under the category of slicing. Now, once we have sliced the data, the next step is we want to split it, right? So we have, so far, we have all of our data, all of our iris data in X and Y. Now we want to go ahead and build a model. But we know that whenever we build a model, we need a train set and a test set, right? So we need train and test. But we have actually two things already, X and Y because that's the way that, that you know, TensorFlow works, right? That we have an X and a Y. 
And so now we're going to need to separate these into an X train and a Y train that are going to be our data sets or variables for training purposes. And then we have a, for the test, we have an X test and we have a Y test. Oops. So basically we have we end up, you know, our original X and Y now gets divided. We go from one, two, to one, two, three, four variables that we will need. So that is easily done, you know, here by using the train, train test split function from sklearn, for instance. Um, so we can just, and, and this can be done with uh, TensorFlow functions as well, but here I'm just mixing it up, you know, as you develop more experience, you can decide you know, to rewrite your code in different ways. So the train test split takes X and Y. It defines the size of the test sample. So that is to say, we're going to say this is 20% and this is 80%. Okay? And then we have some random state 42 or some other thing. That usually is used so that, let's say that you always want to get the same random output so you can always pick the same number and it guarantees that you will always get the same randomization. So once we do this, this function that takes the X and the Y will return our four data sets. So it returns X train, X test, that's X train, X test, Y train, right? And so we end up with our four um, data sets there. And we're ready now to continue to the next step. So you can see we can now split the data from X and Y to obtain the train and test sets that I just described. And keep in mind that only the labels need to be one hot encoded, right? So one hot encoding, which is what I define to be that this process here, right? Only applies to this column, the class column here, right? So this is the only column that it applies to. So you don't have, so that basically tells you, well, these are the Y's and these are the X's. So just remember, or you know, write it over here. This is the Y and this is the X. So just remember that you only apply one hunt encoding to the Y's. So that tells you then, since we had X test, Y test, and we have Y train and Y, y test, we, you know, for, for doing one hot encoding for one hot encoding um, we only need to apply it to the Y so Y train and Y test so we take Y train and Y test you know use some function like our like uh, in a previous video I described how to create your own one hot encoding function so you can use that one or TensorFlow does have some very nice built-in one-hot encoding functions, so you can use those. So from Y train and Y test, now we get the, the variables Y train one hot and Y test one hot. So remember, whereas Y train, oops, whereas Y train looked like this. Y train one hot now looks it's more of a matrix, so it's going to look like one zero 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 one one zero oh zero one zero zero one zero and then this one zero zero one. So that's what you get by doing that, right? And that's just a specific thing that you need for. TensorFlow to work. Okay. So in the code above, we take the labels Y train and Y test, pass them through our one hot encoding function to produce the new variables Y train one hot and Y test one hot. Now, whenever you want to visualize your data, let's say that you want to see what it looks like, you can do the following. You can visualize the new one hot encoded vectors by running the following. So we do a print statement. If you're using Python 3, it would be something like that, right? So print 
Y train one hot, and then notice it's a matrix so we can slice it. So this slice means what? We take from zero to 20, right? So that's the first 20 rows. And for all of those, we look at all the columns. So, you know, it might be that your data set is really large. You only have three classes, let's say, but you don't want to look at all of them, right? So for instance, Iris has 150 and three one hot encoded, encoded columns. So this would give you just the first 20 rows and the one hot encoded labels in there. Uh, now I should say that I, if you, in the code I was using a built-in function of a function that you can write yourself. However, TensorFlow does provide its own built-in functions, all right, for one hot encoding and it's something like this. So it's tf one hot. Right, so this function takes a y vector and converts it to the same one hot encoded version. So we can see a little example of this here in the slides. Um, so for instance, we have indices 0, 1, 2. Right, so we have 0, 1, 2. Right? And we indicate that it's a depth of 3 because there's three classes. And now we do print tf dot one hot encode indices and depth. And when we print that, it's going to look like one zero 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 one zero and then zero zero one, which you can see that here. All right, so that's what uh, the built in TensorFlow one hot encoded function does. So this is another way of doing it. Now, keep in mind that. Um, this will, won't actually run, right? Instead, you have to use the session run because everything in TensorFlow is a graph. Even something as simple as or trivial as that, it is actually a graph. So what you have to do is you have to take, um, you have to run it with the session run. Now, for, as an exercise for you, go ahead and, for the student, try this in your Python code and see what it get, gives you, but it should be pretty, uh, pretty obvious what it does. So now that we've completed everything, we have our data, we've sep we have our X train, Y train, X test, uh, X train, X train, Y train, X test, Y test, we have our four data sets and we've done everything. The next step in the process is to scale the data, scale the X data. So scaling the data basically is, you know, let's say you have port numbers and protocols, right? So as features, so you know that port numbers go from zero to 65,000 port numbers, but then the protocols that we are using only go from zero to let's say 20. So what happens is, and let's make this a little bit more obvious, is that you end up with something like this, right? So this one, this axis here is much, much larger than this one. So it kind of overpowers the entire, and it, it kind of, it makes it seem like this one is more important than say this feature over here. So you never really want that. Instead, what you want to do is you want to have something where the scales are the same for everyone. So maybe scale everything between zero and one, right? So you map everything like that. And so that's called scaling. So I always recommend scaling the data. In all machine learning, whether deep learning or regular machine learning, you should always scale the data. So I suggest running your data with scaling and without to compare the performance of your classifier. So let's see if, if you know, once, if you forget to scale, are your results slightly worse than if you actually scale the data? So usually in practice though, you will notice that convergence of your deep learning algorithm and the classification results can be better with scale data. So again, TensorFlow has its own scaling uh, functions, but for our purposes, we can continue to use sklearn's function, which is standard scalar. So we can call this, you know, scaling or 
that's the name of our slide. All right, so now we have the code here. All right, so after we've done, so after we've done the previous step of scaling our data, there's a few other things that we can look at. So for instance, we want to know, let's say that your you know, you write code that you want to use for several data sets. So you always want to have a simple function that um, tells you how many features you have and how many columns or how many classes. Right, so in that case, let's call it A and B. So A is the number of features and B is the number of classes. So for instance, for the MNIST data set, which has nine digits, it would have 10 classes. And four, uh, four features, four iris, and three classes. So how do we do that? All right. Um, there's... Uh, because the data sets like X train normalize, right? Or Y train or Y train one hot, because these variables are objects themselves, they have built in methods, right? They have built in methods uh, such as shape. The shape object just tells you the dimensions of something. So in this case, uh, if we think of Y train one hot, we know that it looks like this, it's something like N by three, right? So if we say that I want shape zero, then it's going to give me n, basically. If I say that I want shape one, it's going to be, give me basically three. So the shape zero represents, you know, usually what we think of as the x-axis, and then this one represents the y-axis, for instance. So if you're thinking of something that looks like that. Right, so in this case, if I say Y train one hot, shape one, I want this. How many columns does it have? So I know it has three columns, therefore B will be three. The same applies for X train normalized. So if we think of X train normalized, it has, again, N samples, and we had F1, F2, F3, F4, for the iris data set, right? So if I say X train normalize dot shape one, shape zero would be this one, it would give me N. If I ask for one, it will give me the number of columns here, which is four. So A was three, the number of, A was, oh sorry, I, I did the, sorry. B was three, B was three, right because I looked at Y train one hot shape one three columns right so the three classes and now I'm looking at a here which is X train normalized so this is let me just say this is sorry this is Y and this is X right so that's the one and so for this one X train normalized I ask for shape one, which is this one. And so it's going to give me the count, one, two, three, four. So this is going to be four, okay? And so now I have basically my dimensions for my data set. By looking at the one hot encoded matrix for Y and the standardized or normalized X train normalized right data set or matrix okay if I want the number of samples then I can do the opposite I can do samples and train right so this one so I take X train normalized and I say shape zero so now I'm gonna pick this shape and it's gonna give me that my result is n so that's the number of samples and if I want to do it for the test set, then I just pick X instead of train. I'm going to pick test. So X test normalized shape zero. Again, it's going to give me the number of samples. Once I have this, I can print it out and I know the number of features, the number of classes, the number of samples in train, the number of samples in test, and so on. All right, so 
this provides a little bit of information on the specifics of my data set. So this is always useful if you want to make your code uh, not have hard-coded values, for instance. At this point, we have completed most of the pre-processing steps. Okay? And we are ready to define the learning algorithm. So if you remember, you know, we talked about the, the, the TensorFlow code, right? So we have libraries, we have the parameters, we have the variables or placeholders, we have the definition of the architecture, Right? And then we had the main loop, which consisted of what? Reading the data and pre-processing the data. So at this point, that's all we've done, right? So we've covered pre-processing the data. We assume that we read the data. But we, we've, you know, at some point we declare the libraries and the parameters. That's easy to do. It's very easy to do. Um, now what remains is that we need to define these important parts. So that's the architecture building our deep learning algorithm. Okay? So at this point we have completed most of the pre-processing steps and now we are ready to define the learning algorithms, which is that part here. This is where we define our neural network architecture. So notice that's the key word there, architecture. You know, this will define also the cost functions that we will use, which is basically how we optimize, how we tell it, okay, you know, evaluate this criteria, the minimize the number of errors, for instance, or something like that. And also define the functions to predict results given test samples. Okay? So that will that's something that we will define in the next set of videos all right but for now we are done with these parts and we are basically ready to move on into the architecture and the plate in storing the data in variables so in summary in this lecture we discuss various aspects of deep learning right so you know we looked at uh, loading the data so we define basically what is tensorflow you know, we defined TensorFlow. We talked about graphs, computational graphs, right? We talked about deep learning and architectures. Deep learning and architectures, right? And we talked a little bit about the code in TensorFlow. and how to pre-process data for TensorFlow, right? In the next set of videos, we will begin, you know, where we left off basically, which is to focus now on the architecture. So this is really where we're gonna start looking at, you know, how to build a deep neural network, and we will start with linear regression.